I'm Rachel Dretson, and I am a documentary film director. Um, directed this four-part Netflix series, uh, Keep Sweet, Pray, and Obey, which uh, was released on June 8th on Netflix. In our minds, the police, even the president of the United States, had no authority over us. Warren Jeffs is our president. He was the prophet. And how could you place a human over God? known as FLDS. It's a far offshoot of the Mormon church and supports the practice of polygamy. The more wives, the more children you have, the higher in heaven you'll be. When you're taught something from birth, from your mother and your father, you believe them because they're your parents. It was for our salvation. You did whatever it took, even if it was wrong. One day, my name was brought up and I was to be married. I was 14. Warren Jeffs took over this religion and turned it into money and power and sex. Young girls were like a commodity owned by the church. Warren had himself 78 wives. 24 of those wives were underage. We're going to go after the criminals and we're going to go after the child abusers. To stand up against a multi-million dollar church, you're going up against a lifetime of conditioning and fear. He took the families away, took their homes away. Might as well just line them up against the wall and shot them. You don't fight the priesthood, you don't fight the prophet. But it was so much bigger than just Warren and me. It happens to everybody eventually. You will come around and see the light. We love you. I love all of you. And go, what the f? Sweet spirit of prayer. This is Factual America. We're brought to you by Alamo Pictures, an Austin and London-based production company making documentaries about America for international audiences. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood. Each week, I watch a hit documentary and then talk with the filmmakers and their subjects. This week, it is my pleasure to welcome Emmy-winning filmmaker Rachel Dretson, the executive producer and director of the hit Netflix docuseries, Keep Sweet, Pray, and Obey. The film tells the chilling story of Warren Jeffs and his rise in the Fundamentalist Church of Christ of Latter-day Saints. Members of the FLDS Church practice polygamy and assign women husbands by divine revelation to the prophet, in this case, Warren Jeffs. These practices led to concerns from outsiders about underage marriage and statutory rape, but no one was prepared for the shocking crimes perpetrated by Warren Jeffs himself. Stay tuned as we learn more about this horrific story and Rachel's efforts to bring it to the screen. Rachel, welcome to Factual America. How are things with you? Very well, thank you, and thanks for having me. Well, thank you for coming to on board to the Factual America podcast. It's uh, great to have you. Uh, as our listeners and viewers will have heard or seen, uh, we're talking about the film Keep Sweet, Pray, and Obey. Uh, it's streaming on Netflix. It's a four-part uh, docu-series. Uh, so congratulations. Uh, this is a regular fixture in the Netflix top 10, at least whenever I'm checking. Um, uh, have you been surprised by, by the reaction? Uh, I have to say I have been a bit. Um, I've been surprised by how well it's done, which is obviously very gratifying. It's been uh, high up in the top 10 for almost two weeks since it initially was released, which is great. Um, and I've also been, I would say, a little bit surprised at just how disturbed people are. Um, hmm. Disturbed in a way that I think is is valuable and important and meaningful, but but still very disturbed. Um, there's a lot of true crime and a lot of horror out there. And I think part of me thought audiences would be more inured to what they mm. see in the documentary, but in fact, they're not. Um, at least the ones that, that are expressing themselves on Twitter and TikTok and other social yeah. media seem to be really shaken um, by what they're seeing yeah. in the series. Well, I, I can understand, have, having seen all four uh, episodes, uh, I can I can understand uh that reaction, actually, I think, uh, well, it's interesting, maybe we're going to talk more about that. I mean, maybe before we get started in that discussion, um, maybe you can tell us uh, for our listeners or uh, viewers who haven't had a chance to see it yet, um, what is Keep Sweet, Pray and Obey about? Maybe you can give us a, 
a synopsis? Sure. Um, well, Keep Sweet, Pray and Obey is about um, an extremist, fundamentalist, polygamist offshoot of the mainstream Mormon church um, called the Fundamentalist Church of the Latter-day Saints. Um, and it's essentially a religion that um, became a cult under the leadership of uh, Warren Jeffs, who was the prophet of the FLDS from 2002 um, until the present. Um, and it looks at both the ways in which Warren and his father transformed the uh, group, but also the, the hunt and ultimately um, conviction of Warren for uh, crimes against children. Yeah, indeed. Um, I mean, you've, you've, so you started telling us a bit about the uh, FLDS church. Um, I mean, maybe, maybe sort of, um, and I think it's fair enough to say, as you say, it's been certainly transformed into a cult. Um, uh, but maybe it's beliefs or practices people may not be aware. What are some of the main practices that maybe if um, people would recognize the FLDS by? Right. Um well, the FLDS being fundamentalist Mormons believe literally in some of the original um, precepts of Mormonism. Um, central to the FLDS is the belief that a man has to have multiple wives. Uh, in fact, that a man has to have at least three wives and be in order to be able to achieve eternal salvation. Mm -hmm. um, that's really the most important um, belief of the FLDS that distinguishes them from the mainstream Mormon church now. And it's certainly at the heart of what we look at in our series. Okay. And as you've already mentioned, at the center of certainly what the documentary explores um, are the, Je the Jeffs, and I mean that in terms of their surnames. It's uh, Rulon Jeffs, who I guess is referred to as Uncle Rulon, and then um, Warren Jeffs. Um, maybe you... Uh, well, I mean, I think you're talking about the reaction you've been receiving. I think it's especially comes down to Warren Jeffs in particular. But maybe you can tell us more about the the father and son and this this family that has uh, basically run this the FLDS for many years. Sure. Well, um, Rulon Jeffs became the prophet in the 1980s, um, and w he was certainly less of a kind of tyrant than his son, but mm -hmm. He actually did um, sort of begin to initiate some of the um, more disturbing, um, yeah. you know, some of, more, some of the more disturbing practices of the church. Um, namely, he, he began to marry um, very young women um, when he was in his 80s. Um, and he had... 65 wives, I believe, by the time that he passed away mm. in 2002, um, a bunch of them were, were much younger. Um, and uh, most of them got married not knowing anything about sex or how babies were made. And in fact, some of them were disturbing scenes in the, in the series involve Rulan, who would take these women to bed um, and try to have some kind of sexual relations with them, despite mm. the fact that they were very young and very innocent, and naive, and, and this was not happening. Um, this was largely happening against their will. Um, mm. And then when he died, um, his son, Warren, who was one of his many children, but his, his favorite, um, sort of forced himself into power. Um, there wasn't a clear line of succession in the FLDS, so it isn't clear when somebody dies who the next mm. prophet would be. But in this case, Warren was pretty manipulative about the ways in which he kind of insinuated himself into that position. And once he took power, he began a really kind of stunning um, concentration of, um, of power that, that involved a very systematic process of sort of punishing people who resisted him or questioned him and rewarding people who didn't, of controlling the way people dressed uh, their schooling, um, what they were allowed to do, think, um, you know, to the point of, of kind of astonishing extremes that mm. um, really sort of boggled the mind. Yeah. I mean, it's not too strong to even use the term like Stalin-esque, isn't it? I mean, he's, he's, it's like full of, I mean, I was, that's what I found surprising, you know, these purges, these, uh, the way he was 
setting people off against each other and and trying to control people, you know, not just trying, actually controlling people's lives was... Yes. Well, you know, he studied Hitler. He actually spoke German and and carried around books that were... Were written by Hitler. So he knew what he was doing. Um, mm. And, you know, he did have these kind of, these, these, these purges um, in which he would not only, you know, throw people out of the church sort of at will without any real cause but he would um and we, we tell the story of one of these purges um, in the series you know he would he would set, tear them away from their families with, and not allow mm. them to say goodbye to their families and essentially throw them out of the church without most of these people had very little by way of education skills independent financial financial mm. standing so they were just you know it was it was a decimation um, and people who were thrown out of the church or who left the church were considered apostates and people inside the church were not permitted to speak to them or see them. So this was like a real, a real trauma for a lot of families. And it ramped up over the course of Warren's rule so that by the end, he was just tearing women from their children, children from their mothers, fathers from their wives. I mean, it was like constant and extremely widespread and he created a generation of trauma in that in that religion yeah i mean i think that is i mean some of the some of the scenes you're talking about this some of the you know there's that one scene where he basically does the big purge um at a, at a meeting i think and that's that was quite chilling and the the surveillance and and everything um and then coupled with sort of the beliefs that people had about his his power and where it emanated from. Um, I mean, we, you've already, I mean, it's, it's you've already mentioned uh, what young women and, and we now in later know girls face, but I mean, generally, what was life like for women or is like for women in the FLDS? Well, the was and the is are quite different uh, and, yeah. and it's actually gotten progressively worse over time. Um, you know, in the early days, um, you know, women were plural wives for the most part, um, but I would say they had a lot more freedom as plural wives. Um, you know, they could dress, they all had to cover their bodies, you know, from neck to ankle, but they could pretty much wear whatever they wanted and they weren't really tracked so closely over the course of Warren's rule, um, women that he started by telling women they couldn't wear the cut. Well, anybody, they couldn't wear the color red. And then women had to wear um, long underwear, you know, that just covered their bodies under their dresses. They wore these floor length dresses. And then it became, they all had to wear, no, they couldn't have any prints. And then he took away colors except for pastels. So they all ended up in these like light pink, light blue, light yellow dresses. And they had to wear their hair in this incredibly specific way, which took hours to do. Um, and no hair could be loose. No hair could be hanging. It had to be sort of poofed up in this very unsightly, yeah. odd looking kind of oval shaped thing. Um, and so that was the kind of aesthetics of being female. But beyond that, women, for the most part, didn't get to go to school um, past fourth or at most eighth grade, um, they were valued only as uh, wives and the breeders of children. And um, beyond that, they really were not given any autonomy or freedom of movement or thought. Um, mm. So it was, a, it was a pretty oppressive existence and it got more and more oppressive as time went on. Um, mm. Then, you know, he started marrying women off at younger and younger ages when he his father was in power. Women tended to get married or girls tended to get married and they were 18 and up, you know, 18 to mm. 21. But Warren started sliding the age down. And, and by the time that he was arrested in 2008, he was marrying girls off as young as 12 to 14, um, had wives himself that were 12 years old. And is that what finally raised eyebrows and concerns? I mean, the, you know, this, this church had been in existence for a long time. Uh, in the wilds of Utah and Arizona, but what finally raised eyebrows? I mean, it's th that they could, you know, live live this existence for so long, and then finally, you st people started snooping around and asking questions. 
Yeah. I mean, it, it took a lot longer than it should have. There, there were a few kind of lone rangers out there, a mm. private investigator named Sam Brower, who we feature in the series, a journalist, a local journalist named Mike Watkins, a few other people who were really, you know, started to get very suspicious and look for um, evidence that Warren was committing crimes and ultimately to try to get witnesses who'd be willing to testify against him. But the state um, and local uh legal authorities didn't really get involved until um, the, the sort of mid 2000s um, when mm-hmm. yes, there were a few women who managed to flee and were willing to speak up and, and testify about what had happened to them. And that was when things really began to tighten and the state began to really pursue Warren Jeffs um, in a, in a serious way, but it was difficult because so few of the girls were willing to to testify because it would just, you know, what was in it for them, really, they would lose everything. Um, and they were, as somebody says in the film, they'd be testifying against their fathers and brothers and husbands. I mean, this wasn't mm-hmm. just Warren Jeffs. This was, a, you know, everybody was marrying younger girls. And so it was a really, it was a pretty widespread practice. Okay. I think that takes us actually to a good point for an early early break. So we'll be right back with Rachel Dretson, director and executive producer of Keep Sweet, Pray and Obey. Uh, It's on Netflix, uh, and it's a four-part docuseries. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with award-winning filmmaker Rachel Dretson, director and executive producer of Keep Sweet, Pray, and Obey, uh, a regular fixture in the top 10 list on uh, Netflix. Um, Rachel, we've been talking about the uh, fundamentalist uh, Church of Latter-day Saints, the FL. FDL. Why well, get this? Always get this wrong. The 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 acronym, whatever it is, it is the uh, fundamentalist Mormon sect uh, stroke cult that uh, we've been talking about. Um, so at this point, I'm not trying to just do this chrono- chronologically, but uh, but Warren Jeffs ends up on the lam, doesn't he? He's kind of uh, on the run. Um, and this interesting thing happens where he, he basically tries to move his flock, not just tries, he does move his flock to Texas. And, and what well, did this he moved entail? some of his flock to Some Texas. of his flock, that's a good point. Um, he's very particular about who gets to go and who doesn't. Uh, Texas was, uh, a pro- it was a ranch that was in a very remote part of Texas that Warren purchased secretly with FLDS money um, and created a, an extraordinary compound there, like almost like a little city. Mm. And um, nobody knew where it was, but everybody, most of his followers at that point were in Utah and Arizona. I ran on the border between Utah and Arizona in a right. small community called Short Creek. And they began hearing about this place that Warren called Zion. And Zion was this mysterious place that was mm. only, you had to be chosen. Actually, the way it was framed is, God had to whisper your name to the prophet. And if he whispered your name to the prophet, and if you were worthy enough, you would be chosen to go. Um, And so people would just, were just disappearing. Um, They would be told that their name had been Mm -hmm. spoken and that they were going to Zion and they didn't know where they were going. And they would be brought in the middle of the night often to this ranch. Um, And on this ranch, you know, they were supposedly among the chosen ones. Um, And over time, more and more of Warren's followers uh, were settled there to the point where there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people there, including about 480 children. Yeah. And, um, And then that leads to, well, there's, I mean, for some people remember it was a highly publicized incident with the um i guess it was what in 2008 or so somewhere in there where uh um texas law enforcement gets involved and they take the children away and it's this incredible scenes of um of even people like oprah winfrey showing up and the the, the members showing up on good morning america and all these staples of of american television um which is it's quite amazing. It's quite uh, quite 
I mean, in the context of, especially as you tell the story, it comes, that kind of part comes, I think, comes in episode three after we've heard all these things about, not all the things that we will that we eventually hear about. Uh, but uh, uh, that, yes, they are, they have their 15 they're 15 minutes uh, in the public eye. And it's a, it's a very strange situation. It's very strange. Um, and it is, it is really the first time that the FLDS became really known, I think, um, um, to, the, to, to the public in a big way. By that point, Warren Jeffs was actually already in prison. He had been convicted. Um, he had two trials, mm. convicted in the first trial. But, you know, the trial happened in Utah and um, his sentence was not, a life sentence. Um, and he um, continued to really run the church from prison. Um, and so there were still hundreds and hundreds of people on the ranch, but law enforcement, Texas, local law enforcement was definitely, you know, they were suspicious. They knew that the, mm. the profit of this community had gone to prison for underage marriage. They didn't really, they, they didn't have a reason to enter the ranch, but they were watching mm. it and waiting. And then they got a call from a girl who claimed to be underage and to be pregnant um, against her will and um, abused. And so they finally obtained a search warrant to go onto the ranch. And when they got there, they realized not only were, they, were there many underage mm. mothers on the ranch, but um, there were hundreds of children. Um, and so they made this decision to remove the children um, and many of the women from the ranch. Um, and that was an enormous operation and got the attention of a lot of the media. Um, what's interesting about it is that the church mounted a, a really sophisticated yeah. PR campaign um, in which a lot of the women whose children had been removed went on television and went on all these shows that they would never have gone on before and wept. Yeah. And, uh, and actually what ended up happening was they really won the public sympathy. Um, and, yeah. um, Texas ended up returning all of those children. I know. And then, but yet eventually, um, I mean, I, a lot of times on our podcast, we talk about spoiler alerts and everything. I don't think, I mean, I don't feel like I even need to say that with this because I, we're not going to go into the details of the stuff that we, uh, that you'll see when you watch this, but it is, um, I think I had a similar re reaction to many of your, to your the people you've uh, been talking to or have watched it. So, I mean, these shocking revelations about what was actually, I mean, it's shocking, not just, it's shocking to the own, to people who are actually, well, at least the former members of the church. I mean, they're aware of some of the things that were going on, but they weren't aware of all the stuff that was going on. And um, uh, I just recommended people sit, watch the watch the film. Um, uh, it's episode four specifically, but uh, but all of the episodes, obviously. But I mean, you've spent a lot of time on this project. You've uh, interviewed a lot of people. How does something like this happen? You think? You mean how how does such evil? Yeah. Flourish? Yeah. Um, well, I think that that's that's really a profound question, and I think much of what I tried to do in the series was sort of explain or show the sort of methodical way in which mm. this kind of brainwashing um, and mind control can happen. Um, you know, these people were born, the vast majority of them were born into this religion. So start there. They didn't yeah. know anything else. Yeah. Um, and they were very isolated from the outside world. Um, even before Warren Jeffs took power, most of the FLDS lived apart um, and they spent time with each other. They didn't interact. Um, but once Warren took power, he forbade television, movies, music, internet, you know, people really, I mean, there's one person in the F in the film says, I didn't even know who the president of the United States was. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, they were really sheltered from outside influences. And so, you know, with that and he infected the religion with fear because people knew that if they disobeyed or questioned mm. him, they could lose everything, including their families. Um, mm. So they dare not do it. Um, so, you know, you put all of that together and you start to understand how actually very bright, rational, mm. good human beings can 
you know, support something that's so extraordinarily despotic. Um, they also did not know the worst of what Warren was up to. Um, vast mm. majority of people in the FLDS did not know. Some still do not know. Mm. This day. Um, and they were told that the outside world were, were monsters um, and were, were out to get them. So they didn't trust the, the information that they got mm. from outside of the cult. Um, it tells you a lot actually about human nature and about the ways in which this kind of mm. thing can happen, which is one of the, I think, one of the strongest things about the story. Yeah. And that, was that, I mean, there, so how did you come along onto this project? Uh, um, well, I, di- I actually had never heard of the FLDS. I was going to um, ask you about that. How did no, you, yeah. I hadn't, um, which is surprising actually, but I, I hadn't heard about it. Um, I mean, I knew there were polygamists, but I really didn't know more than that. Um, yeah. Uh, somebody in my, I have a documentary film company and we have a vice president of development, very talented man named Zach Herman. And he had spoken to, um, a journalist named Alison DeMom, who's now one of our executive producers about the story. She had essentially brought the story to him and he brought it to me. And initially I, I was not, um, I was, you know, a little kind of, I don't know. I had a little bit of an allergic reaction to the subject matter. I thought this sounds really, you know, really out there and mm. the kind of thing you see on, you know, junk TV. You know, <laughs> I was I was a little hesitant yeah. to get in on it until um, I went I went to Utah and I met with um, the private investigator, Sam Brower, who's who's mm. in the series, as well as some of the women. Uh, he introduced me to several people who had left the FLDS and I. I was really um, astonished, mm. honestly, by, by the fact that this this still exists in 21st century America. Yeah, I couldn't believe it, and I thought to him, and I couldn't believe how relatable the people I met were. Mm. And I just thought, you know, if this is so stunning to me, it feels like a story that that needs to be told. And so that's when I decided to start developing the story. It took me a long time to figure out a way to do it. Um, right. And that's that took a couple of years, actually. And what was, I mean, in terms of what was that main challenge? What was that you're dealing well, with? Well, I didn't want to, I didn't want to kind of succumb to the shock value of the material. Yeah. I mean, it is shocking, but um, the, the FLDS had been covered in the media over over the years, mm-hmm. and it tended to be done not not across the board, but it tended to be done in a very sensationalized way. Um, people focused on the sex, you know, and, mm. um, and I really wanted to find another way um, in. And, um, and it was really when I decided to tell the story mostly from the perspective of women, um, particularly women who had stood up against the evils um, of the church that I began to see a, a, a new way of telling an old story. Um, and I think a story that had never really been approached um, in a in a kind of holistic, comprehensive way. I also really wanted to tell the story of the way this kind of power, mm. totalitarian power was built. Um, yeah. And that hadn't, hadn't really been done. So those were the, those were sort of my two goals. Yeah. Well, and, and certainly achieved. I mean, you, as someone who uh, was, you know, we, I've, we, we got you on, I was going to watch it. I was like, okay, um, like you, what am I, what is this about? Um, and it's anything but sensationalized, uh, certainly. And it's, uh, Thank you. and it's an extremely compassionate storytelling I found, um, because it would have been very easy to, I don't know. I mean, not that that's what proper documentary filmmakers do, but it'd been very easy to pay, put a lot of these people in a, bad light and just make them all look like a bunch of bumpkins or whatever. And, uh, I think, um, and I, I agree with you. They, everyone comes across so, so well, it's very, it's very compelling from, from that standpoint. And I guess, I guess the other main challenge maybe would have been, I mean, how, with something like this, how do you make women live through this again? Cause they, they do have to tell this story again, one that they've already maybe told in court or, or, or maybe never have told at all. It's a great question, and it was one of the one of the most challenging uh, aspects of making the series was having to interview these women about this this trauma, which had happened for many of them over decades. Um, we um, our interviews were very long. Um, a lot mm. of them ran eight, 
eight, 10, 12 hours, um, which we would spread out if we could over several days, but it was pretty grueling. Um, I, I felt like I did not want to um, edit these women. I wanted to allow them to mm. do this their way. And for many of them, they were telling their, their life story. Um, and so it was really important to just take our time, give them space. We had at least one subject, central, central subject in the film. After the first day, um, the first, we got about halfway through the interview. Um, and she, she couldn't continue for several months. It, yeah. it took several months for her to feel like she was ready to keep going. Um, so that was the other thing we tried to do was just be patient um, mm -hmm. with, with them. Um, it was very difficult. You know, it was very emotional. It was very difficult. Watching the series was, was difficult. Mm. Although I would say one of the most gratifying things about this experience for me has been that every single subject that we interviewed has reached out to us since the series aired and expressed such gratitude and really it feels good about yeah. what they saw, which is, which is really gratifying because, you know, it's a, it's a very dark story. Um, it is. So, but we really, we really tried to put them at the center of, of the story. Um, I think a lot of the time with true crime, you end up getting really fascinated by the perpetrator and mm. Warren Jeff's quite fascinating, no question about it, but we tried to make sure the focus stayed on the victims, um, on survivors. Yeah. And I think, well, indeed. And I, I think, uh, it's, well, I very much appreciate it. And I, I think it's, uh, I think it's extremely well told and it's a story worth in that regard is, is certainly well worth, worth telling. I mean, you've obviously spent a lot of time in sort of Arizona, Utah and these areas. I mean, the, um, the, uh, F LDS is still going, um, still going, isn't it? It's, it still exists. It does still exist. It is still going there. Are, nobody knows exactly how many people still follow Warren Jeffs, but seems like thousands. Um, yeah. It's definitely lost a lot of its power um, over the years since he went to prison. Um, and many, many more people have left and more and more people leave um, every yeah. year. Um, but yeah, I met many people who are still in the FLDS and still very loyal to Warren. Mm. Um, it is, it is extraordinary. But, you know, when you think about it, again, you're born into something like this. Um, you never, ever learned how to trust anything outside of it. It's very difficult to leave it. You know, it's yeah. not an easy thing. What's miraculous is that people do leave, actually, that so many people do leave. That's well, important. yeah, and we, and we didn't go into it, but there's certainly so many, you know, you have, it's, it's, it's certainly told in, you know, we see it in the doc, uh, you know, efforts of people who did try to leave at least the first time and how they were brought back in and how they were found. And, you know, it's, um, and as you say, the, the ties to family and all these things. So, um, no, it's very, it's very interesting. It's one of these very thought provoking docs because it gets you think, you know, um, it's not, it's, well, it is obviously about the f a fundamentalist Mormon sect, but it is beyond so much more than that in terms of human character and, and uh, what any of us would be like if we had been in similar circumstances. So um, exactly, that's exact. I mean, that for me, that was the big revelation. Was if I if I were in similar circumstances, I can't say that I would have done anything different. And that's not the way we usually think of people. Yeah. You know. So what's next for you? More uh, true crime? Um, can you? You have any uh, projects you can you can tell us about? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure yet, actually. I'm, I'm exploring a few different stories. I wish I were at liberty to say what they are, but they're not far enough along for me to say. I have a production company, so we also, we're doing a bunch of projects that I'm executive producing. So that's been keeping okay. me pretty busy. A um, couple of uh, projects for HBO and, and yeah. uh, elsewhere, but um, we'll wait We'll see. Ask me in a few months and I'll okay. give you an answer. Well, we'd <laughs> love to. We'd love to have you back back on once you've uh, settled on a project or get something uh, in, in production. But I, I imagine you might go for something that's not quite as, as dark. Could you do something like this again or anytime soon? Um, well, that's an, a really interesting question. I definitely think I probably won't do something as dark, but I will say that the territory um, is so rich um, 
And in many ways, I don't feel done with it. Um, There's so many stories around this group that we didn't get a chance to tell. And many of them are actually uplifting. They're stories Mm. of people building their lives, you know, and trying to reinvent themselves and enter mainstream society. I mean, it's, it's so rich. Um, So I'm not sure I'm done with that. Okay. Um, Okay. I also fell in love with Utah. Um, Utah is just the Mm. most exquisite, exquisitely beautiful landscape. I mean, you see it in the series that just like, it's almost godly, you know, you can understand why these people were so overwhelmed in a way because the landscape itself is so, is so stunning and big. Um, So yeah. Well, well, we'll keep we'll, we'll keep an eye out for another uh, another doc related to this and any others that you have. Could yeah. Happen. Well, we'll we'll certainly well, I, and I know it will be done well if you if you do it. So thank you again so much for uh, for coming on to the for the podcast. It's been a joy having you. Uh, just to remind our listeners, we've been talking with award winning filmmaker Rachel Dretzen, director and executive producer of Keep Sweet, Pray and Obey. I tell you, I will never be able to hear that term "keep sweet" again. It's just, ch- it's chilling. It just yeah. makes me. Uh, anyway, it's a film. It's on Netflix. It's a four-part docu series. Definitely give it a watch. Uh, thanks again, Rachel. Love to have you on again. So much sometime. for having me. I really enjoyed it. All right. Take care. Thank you. You too. Bye bye. Bye. I'd like to give a shout out to Sam and Joe Graves at Intersound Audio in Eskrick, England, in deepest, darkest Yorkshire. A big thanks to Nevin Apanovich, podcast manager at Alamo Pictures, who ensures we continue getting great guests onto the show. And finally, a big thanks to our listeners. As always, we love to hear from you, so please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas. You can reach out to us on YouTube, social media, or directly by going to our website, www.factualamerica.com, and clicking on the Get In Touch link. And as always, please remember to like us and share us with your friends and family, wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Alamo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.